Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the um, Alliance for hosting a great meeting again uh, this year. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, share a brief overview of the Voyager story. Uh, okay. Um, Please note, we're a public company. I'll be making forward-looking statements. I uh, would refer you to our reports on file with the SEC for further information. So Voyager Therapeutics is an AAV gene therapy company focused on disorders of the central nervous system. Uh, we've built a robust product engine focused on the engineering, optimization, and manufacture of these novel AAV uh, viral-based vectors, uh, enabling a current uh, product pipeline of seven programs uh, targeting severe neurological diseases. Our lead program is currently in an ongoing Phase 1B clinical study, and we'll have some clinical data uh, released uh, towards the end of this year. It's focused on patients uh, with advanced Parkinson's disease. Uh, back in February of 2015, we announced a major strategic collaboration with Sanofi Genzyme. Uh, in addition to contributing significant capital to the company, uh, as many of you in the audience may know, uh, Legacy Genzyme has been in and around the gene therapy space for well over 20 years. So there was a lot of technical know-how, uh, expertise, intellectual property, even some product programs uh, that were contributed to Voyager as part of that collaboration, and they've been great partners for us over the last um, almost two years now. Uh, Voyager's in a strong financial position. Uh, as of the end of June, we reported $204 million uh, in cash, uh, no debt. And what we've said publicly from a guidance perspective is uh, we have cash runway into 2019. Uh, we've assembled an outstanding management team uh, and roster of scientific founders that have really pioneered uh, significant advances in the field of AAV gene therapy and neuroscience. Uh, I think critically, uh, we have members of our team that have extensive uh, CNS drug development expertise that they bring to the table. I think that's best exemplified uh, with our president and CEO, Steve Paul. Uh, after a long and distinguished career at the NIH, uh, Steve went to Eli Lilly. Uh, he was there for almost 20 years. Um, his uh, last position was worldwide head of R&D. Uh, then he joined Third Rock Ventures as a venture partner, helped found uh, Sage Therapeutics, which is another uh, biotech company in, this, in the CNS space, and was part of the team that helped create and, and launch Voyager before becoming uh, president and CEO of the company. I, can't, I don't have time to go through the rest of the team. It's a fantastic team. I uh, love working with them uh, every day. Uh, the two most common high-level questions we get, uh, why CNS, why use an AAV gene therapy approach, uh, on the CNS side, uh, there remains a significant unmet medical need for a number of these diseases uh, to really help uh, patients. Um, a number of these disorders are what is commonly referred to as a monogenic disorder, so highly validated targets from a genetic perspective, uh, ideally suited in many respects uh, for a gene therapy approach. Uh, what Voyager and others have shown is uh, delivery using AV vectors to the relevant cells in the CNS uh, is achievable, so there's great proof of concept from a preclinical perspective there. And one of the inherent advantages of the cells in the CNS that we're targeting is they're what are known as terminally differentiated cells. So we really believe uh, using an AAV vector-based approach, we can achieve, uh, achieve durable long-term uh, expression of our therapeutic gene of interest after a single administration. On the AAV side, uh, the clinical experience continues uh, to improve and expand. Uh, to date, over 1,300 patients have been treated with AAV gene therapy products for a variety of indications, over 200 uh, for CNS disorders specifically. We've seen no AAV-related uh, serious adverse events, so obviously very encouraging from a safety and a tolerability perspective. Um, last point I'll make is on manufacturing, echoing uh, what others have presented. Uh, we believe firmly that uh, any successful AAV gene therapy company is going to have uh, as its core competency uh, a manufacturing platform. It's something that we've invested in early uh, in the company's evolution. We've built an outstanding team, including uh, recruiting the inventor of the Baclovirus SF9 uh, production system for recombinant AAV vectors. Uh, on site, we have a state-of-the-art process R&D lab. Uh, we're doing research-grade production as well uh, on a small scale, and we ha have a publicly announced collaboration with an institution known as Mass Biologics uh, for GMP manufacturing, which we started uh, earlier this year for our Parkinson's program. 
So at a high level, if you look at our pipeline, which will be on the next slide, uh, there's three different modalities that we're uh, pursuing from an AAV gene therapy perspective. One is traditional gene replacement, going in with a healthy version of a gene uh, in an instance where uh, the gene is mutated as part of this disease state. We also have expressed RNAi. We're using microRNA cassettes in instances where it's a toxic gain of function mutation. You're seeking to knock down expression of the gene of interest. And more recently, we actually announced our first vectorized antibody program. So as many of you may know, uh, you can actually clone the genes for an antibody into an AAV vector. These are the heavy and light chain genes. And from a CNS perspective, has two potential significant advantages. Uh, first is you can get significantly higher expression of your therapeutic uh, antibody of interest uh, in the CNS uh, relative to just IV administration of a, a naked antibody, if you will. Um, the second is it's durable expression. So you're actually putting the genes inside the cells uh, for expression of the therapeutic antibody over a long period of time. So our initial program uh, that's on the, the next slide is actually targeting tau, so it's an anti-tau antibody uh, vectorized um, into an AAV vector. I'm not going to have time uh, this afternoon to go through all of our product programs in detail. I'll spend most of the time on our advanced Parkinson's disease program. Uh, but just a quick overview um, behind that, we are pursuing uh, a monogenic form of ALS. This is toxic gain-of-function mutations uh, in the SOD1 gene. Uh, we have programs targeting Friedrich's ataxia. Huntington's disease, spinal muscular atrophy. I mentioned the anti-tau program. Initially, we're going after frontotemporal dementia, but that obviously has implications in terms of potentially treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then also recently, we announced a NAV 1.7 program. This is a sodium channel implicated in signaling uh, for pain. And it's been shown if you can knock down or knock out expression of uh, NAV 1.7, uh, you can have uh, a significant effect. Uh, switching gears to our lead program, uh, AADC01 for advanced Parkinson's disease. Just a quick overview of Parkinson's disease, second most common neurodegenerative disorder. In the U.S. at any given time, there's approximately 700,000 people uh, with Parkinson's. It's roughly 15% or about 100,000 people have what is commonly referred to as advanced Parkinson's disease. So these are patients that are no longer uh, having their symptoms uh, adequately controlled by the gold standard therapy, which is uh, L-DOPA, and it's really these advanced patients that represent the initi initial target population uh, that we believe is going to be appropriate for our gene therapy approach. Um, just want to spend a m minute talking about the biology and the mechanism here. It's important to understand uh, to fully appreciate uh, our therapeutic approach from a gen gene therapy perspective uh, for Parkinson's. Uh, Parkinson's is fundamentally a disease of dopamine or a lack of dopamine, and the key pathway to keep in mind is the conversion of L-DOPA into dopamine via an enzyme uh, known as aromatic L-amino acid decarboxylase, or AADC. And in a healthy individual, uh, there's a region of the brain known as the substantia nigra. Uh, the cells in that region of the brain actually express AADC to allow for the conversion of L-DOPA into dopamine. They release the dopamine into a second region of the brain known as the putamen, and that allows for downstream signaling, motor function, and, and motor control. In a Parkinson's disease patient, neurodegenerative dis disorder, it's the cells in the substantia nigra that actually are dead and dying as part of the disease process. So what we're simply looking to do uh, from a therapeutic perspective is deliver the gene uh, encoding for AADC directly into the putamen. It's important to appreciate two key points. One is the cells, the neurons in the putamen uh, that we're targeting with the gene therapy are not uh, dying as part of the disease process. Second is they normally don't express AADC. So we're essentially through the gene therapy approach conferring the ability for these cells to convert the L-DOPA into dopamine and create a little bit of a dopamine reservoir in that region of the brain with the goal of, in these advanced Parkinson's disease patients, uh, providing uh, downstream symptomatic relief, symptomatic benefit, specifically for the motor symptoms uh, associated with the disorder. So at a high level, uh, this is a schematic of the disease uh, progression associated with Parkinson's. Early on, patients recently diagnosed, reasonably well controlled on their oral medication, on their L-DOPA. What happens to all patients over time is uh, they continue to progress. Uh, there's actually a reduction in the amount of AADC being expressed as these cells in the substantia nigra uh, continue to die. And the patients achieve shorter and shorter periods of what is commonly referred to as off time, or I'm sorry, on time, uh, where they're achieving um, good sy symptomatic control 
uh, from a disease perspective. What we're trying to do with the gene therapy is essentially turn back the clock for these patients uh, and rewind from the advanced stages to more of the earlier stages where they're more responsive uh, to their oral uh, L-DOPA medication and achieve uh, good symptomatic control, good sy symptomatic benefit. So how are we doing this? At a high level, we're taking an AAV vector that encodes for the gene uh, for AADC. We're delivering it in a very site-specific way using pretty uh, sophisticated methodology, real-time MRI-guided delivery, uh, to make sure we get it exactly in the region of the brain where we want it to go. Um, and as you can see in the bottom left-hand side, this is just a rendering of a patient. The patient's actually in an MRI machine during the neurosurgical procedure. On the bottom right, this is a 3D reconstruction uh, of the delivery. So the green region, um, those are the putamen. So we each have two putamen in our brain. Uh, and then the red and the blue represent the injection of the, the viral vector. So two things. One is we can confirm in real time as the patient's uh, undergoing the procedure that we, yes, indeed, are delivering the AAV vector uh, precisely where we want it to go. Secondly, we're actually able to measure how much of the putamen we're covering with the viral vector. And the reason that's important is we know from preclinical studies uh, where you see the coverage uh, is actually where you're going to see expression of your therapeutic gene of interest. And the threshold, based on some non-human primate work, seems to be approximately 30%. If you get over 30% coverage uh, in the patients, we believe you're going to see meaningful uh, clinical benefit uh, as a result of the treatment. So where are we in terms of uh, the ongoing study? I mentioned it's an ongoing phase 1B study. The way we describe it uh, at a high level, it's a delivery optimization dose escalation trial. And what I mean by that, uh, the delivery optimization piece is we've been steadily increasing the infusion volume in order to uh, achieve adequate coverage of the putamen with the viral vector. Um, I don't have time to go through all the detail, but in the most recent cohort that we completed, we announced on average in cohort two, we achieved 34% uh, coverage above that 30% threshold that we had been targeting. So what we did immediately after that is we initiated uh, the third cohort in the trial, which began the dose escalation phase. So we increased in cohort three uh, the amount of virus, the concentration of virus that we're delivering uh, by about threefold relative to cohort two. We kept the infusion volume the same because we feel like we're in a, in a good place um, uh, with regards to coverage. So the primary objective for any phase 1B study, obviously, safety and tolerability are, are paramount, but we're also going to be looking at clinical efficacy uh, using kind of the standard measures, improvement in off time or reduction in off time, uh, the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, specifically looking for improvement in motor symptoms. And again, I don't have time to go in, into a lot of detail, but we have an entire basket of really nice biomarkers available to us as part of this study. We're actually able to measure expression and activity of the, the enzyme, uh, so not only knowing we're achieving, um, not only know that we're achieving site-specific delivery, but but the protein is actually uh, being expressed and is active. And we also have some tests we can do to measure increased or improved sensitivity uh, to L-DOPA in these patients following uh, treatment with the gene therapy. And this is really uh, exemplified um, by this uh, patient data that has been previously released. So in the second cohort, the first patient uh, dose in the second cohort, this was the, the highest infusion volume that we've tested to date. Uh, we saw, albeit early, very encouraging signs of efficacy. We saw about a four-hour reduction in off time. Uh, we saw about a nine-point reduction or improvement in UPDRS3 motor in the off medication state. Uh, this was all in the context of the patient actually reducing the amount of L-DOPA that they were taking uh, by approximately 40%. So the reason we got excited about this data is not because of any one single measure. It's really a sum of the evidence type of exercise, especially since we don't have a control group uh, in this open label study. And with everything uh, the biomarkers, as well as the clinical endpoints pointing in the same direction, um, this was, um, you know, something that uh, generated a lot of excitement, not only internally at Voyager, but externally as well. So uh, just wrapping up, uh, next steps, kind of milestones for the company. So on the Parkinson's program, uh, in Q4 of this year, we'll have the six-month follow-up data for cohort two, for the entire cohort two, uh, that we'll present uh, and we'll, we'll release. 
Uh, we've already started enrolling cohort three over the summer, as I mentioned, and we've publicly announced. We'll have six-month follow-up data from that cohort uh, sometime in the first half of next year, both very important uh, clinical readout events for, for the program. And if everything continues to look good, we'll be on track to initiate a sham-controlled or a placebo-controlled study for the Parkinson's program in the latter part of 2017, which is a nice bridge to the rest of our pipeline. Didn't have a chance to go through uh, the rest of the pipeline in any detail, but our ALS SOD1 program will be next up from a clinical development perspective. We'll have a lead clinical candidate at uh, the end of this year, which will put us on track to file an IND uh, in late 2017. And slotted in right behind that, you have our Friedrichs Ataxia and Huntington's disease programs, which will have lead candidates for uh, in the early 17 timeframe, enabling INDs for both programs in early uh, 2018. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up. Thank you for your attention.